I'm here talking to Edward Crutchley, who is an up and coming, in fact, not more than that. He's a well established designer now. And um, he's going to talk about his career and give advice to those who want to follow his path. Yes. So let's talk very briefly mm -hmm. about your, um, your education. Mm -hmm. Did you go to a provincial college first and then to one of the London ones? No, or? I started foundation at St. Martin's. I knew that was where I wanted to go, okay. so went, got straight in. And then degree at St. Martin's, women's wear, BA. And then I didn't do an MA, I went into work. Which was where? Betty Jackson. Oh, right. Yes. So what were you doing there? Because she doesn't do men's wear. No, I was working in production. So I was dealing with production on Betty's second line. It was a very varied job. I learned a lot of things. I was dealing with factories, shipping, customs, logistics, pick and pack, nothing to do with design whatsoever. But I learned a lot about what goes on after design is finished, which has been very useful. Well, vital. Yes, yeah, yes. So, um, is that why you'd planned it, or no, it just was, happened? It the just job happened. came up, and, exactly. and you took it. Yes. How long were you there? Two years. And then? And then two years at Pringle, when Claire. Oh, had you started out. to design then? No, there I was doing fabric buying and development. Mm -hmm. So that was when Claire had take Claire Wake Keller had taken over. It was it was really interesting to see. It was really a rebrand of a heritage yes. company. Yes. So that was a very interesting thing to see. But it was the first time I really got involved in fabrics and textiles and understanding fibers and how those are applicable to luxury companies. And I was there for another two years. I then had a very brief stint at Burlington Socks. And then I moved to Paris, to Vuitton, where I was doing fabric development for men's. I was there for 11 years. Good God. Yes. I, I know, I don't look old enough, do I, Colin? You look as if you've <laughs> just come out of school, <laughs> kindergarten. Um, so that must have been a terrific experience. It was an amazing experience. Ooh, that was the sort of icing on the cake, I suppose. It was. I mean, I went there with a a good knowledge, mm -hmm. but through the suppliers I was able to work with and learn from and the questions I could ask, and also the budget I then had to spend on things, I just learned so, so much more. And it allowed me to travel, so I was able to visit suppliers in Japan, I'd be in Italy however often I needed to go. It also meant I could work a lot more in the UK with some of the amazing um, wool supplies that we have here. Yeah. So it really opened my doors to the possibilities of textiles, and that was a really key moment in my career, I think. And that, in a way, rounded it off, I suppose, in a way. Mm. Yes, I suppose so. So then? So then I moved to... Well, whilst I was there, I was doing some freelance jobs. I worked for a couple of companies in China. I did two seasons with Kanye on his various different lines. I worked for a, with Richard Nichol on his last season, uh, okay. which was a lovely experience, one I remember very fondly. Um, I also worked, consulted for some suppliers in the UK, in Italy, again, Japan. And then 14 months ago, I moved to Dior. How did that happen? Did you feel right? I want to start designing my own line because a lot of what mm. you said was administration and making the whole yep. name of the company work. Mm. But did you feel I'm ready to start doing it for myself? Well, I think it got to a point where I'm lucky that I'm very involved in the collections and the direction that they're taking. But you, whenever you work for someone, you always have ideas. And sometimes they go forward and sometimes they don't. You can't have an ego about these things. That's just how it is. But I had ideas that I knew weren't right for the companies that I was working for, but I knew they were good ideas. And that was the point where I decided, right, I should be doing these. Yeah. They're, they're worthy of being seen, and no one's going to do them if I don't. Well, that's quite nice to know, really, that you've yes. got a unique 
vision. I well. hope so. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm wondering, so how long is it since you came down from, since you finished at St. Martin's? 16 years. And do you think this is the way it will be? Do you not want the responsibility of having your own company with your name on it? Well, I think the reality is I couldn't afford to have my own company. Oh. But would you like to? Um, I'm not sure I get, I get a lot out of working for other people because it allows you to explore things in different ways that then can reflect back on your company where you can, there's so much cross-pollination okay. between the two in terms yeah. of ideas and inspiration, yeah. even though they're quite different, that I wouldn't struggle to do my own line without working, but I think it would be less interesting. Okay. So if you were advising mm. young people coming from university now, would you say that yours is not necessarily the best path, because each one has its own personality, but would you say it's a very good way of getting a lot of experience. Yes, and I think experience is key. Oh, it's essential. I, it's a cruel world, the fashion yes. world. You can't make many mistakes. And I don't, I'm amazed at people who can go from university and start a, a company yeah. that functions. Yeah. I have no idea how they do it. And I can't imagine starting a company without understanding merchandising, range planning, shipping, customs, distribution, without having at least some knowledge of how that functions and how to prepare yourself for it, how you can make a company that actually is a success. But in a sense, if they have a you, they don't need to worry so much about that. Ah, but there aren't many of me. Oh, indeed not. <laughs> indeed not. How true. I've often said, oh, that Edward, he's so unique. All right, so um, what do you feel about fashion generally? Do you still feel it's a grown-up thing to be doing? Yes, I do. Why? Well, it's how we express ourselves. It's the ultimate expression of self, I feel. Because you mean as a designer? No, as a consumer. I was going to say, yes, it helps the consumer. Because the clothes are how we communicate who we are to the outside mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very valuable thing to be part of. I mean, ultimately, it is just clothes. It's products. I don't see fashion as some great artistic endeavor that should be put on a pedestal. I think there are elements of that within it, but ultimately, it is a, it's commerce. It's designed commerce. It's beautiful commerce. But if you, can't, if you don't sell it, it becomes a pointless exercise. Mm, absolutely. So in a way, um, you're... you're in a sense, your own, you have your own empire. Mm -hmm. And you might not necessarily have very much, if they trust you, they don't interfere so much, the designers and the money men. How do you get on with the money men? Not well, just with the people you're now with, mm. with Dior, but coming up, do you find that they are very, they find it very difficult to understand why sometimes ideas have to take precedence over financial concerns or... No, I don't personally find it difficult no. because I think it's about having a conversation and understanding why they're having a problem, mm -hmm. giving them answers and showing them if we spend this money yeah. on this vintage research, what I can take from it is this idea, this idea, this idea mm -hmm. that will lead to this revenue stream, this yeah. revenue. If you talk to people in ways that they understand and show them what the results of something can be, then I find generally that they're very open and right. willing to contribute to those types of costs. Who goes to their board meetings or their financial meetings? You presumably have to be there because you are dealing with a lot of the money, the bread and butter money in, in a way, and the nuts and bolts of things that you have to decide whether it's a good thing or not. Am well, I wrong? In, in large companies, there's always somebody more senior than you generally yes. speaking so yes. i'm never in those sorts of like very high level conversations no. but, but you must uh, have a lot of say in what happens in your little well not little your world in my, in my areas yes mm. i do mm -hmm. and but that's 
that comes from having the experience and the knowledge to be able to be confident in what you're saying, I think, and know what the right direction to take for a business is both financially and creatively. Because those things, people think of them as very different, but they're, they're really the same thing. In what sense? Well, one can't survive without the other. They're, they're intrinsically linked. So if you don't have the creative, you don't have the business. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have the financials and the business, there's no room to be creative. So <clears throat> I think it's something that we should talk about more, the importance of the people who deal with financials and budgets. And it's when we talk about, oh, I want to be in fashion that everyone thinks I want to be a designer. But there's so many other things that you can do that are really interesting, exciting jobs. And also not so dangerous, you know? Fashion designers can get kicked out of it. Yes. Not someone like you, of course, <laughs> but you know, they can be kicked out. And also, mm -hmm. it's quite exciting, I should imagine, sort of dealing on the money level, mm -hmm. if you have that sort of mind. I think so. And also, you know, traveling around the world to go to different stores sure. as a merchandiser. You do or... understand, Edward. They're not sending you on a holiday. <laughs> You're expected to do something. Yes, yes I understand do, that. Do However, so please. I'm so pleased. If you have a young designer who you think is talented and has perhaps worked in mm -hmm. some other company, how would you set about teaching them the importance, and I suppose the pitfalls as well, of creating a stable and sound source, um, source, what should we say, base? Well, I mean, anyone that I work with understands the importance of suppliers because- What do you tell them about them? Well, without suppliers, nothing happens. Nothing happens. I mean, I'm, I'm very lucky with the suppliers that I work well, with. Well, with working with Dior, it's not just your personality, it's the kudos of Dior, mm -hmm. surely. They want to keep that connection. It is, but there are, there are plenty of companies with lots of kudos, and I don't think they all have the same approach to suppliers. I mean, when I was working on my Walmart Prize collection, I spoke to the suppliers that I know and that I've worked with a lot and said, this is what I'm doing. What can we do together that's going to be new and exciting? And because of the way that I work with people, they were open to that and they were open to make new fibers and see what could be done with Merino that was exciting and new and felt like, I mean, there's so many things that you can do that it was really, we then had to narrow it down quite quickly. But without suppliers who are open to supporting your, supporting your businesses, experimentation and creativity and new ways of thinking, the, the fashion industry would be over in two seasons. There'd be nothing left. And I think What's happened, particularly in the UK, is we've seen so many suppliers oh, disappear. Yeah, yeah. But the ones who are left are the ones that have embraced change and have embraced different ways of thinking about fabrics and are open to novelty. And the ones that have disappeared are the ones that were not. Right. So really, in a way, it's the ones who are trying to push the barriers forward Absolutely. who survive. Absolutely. Which brings us very nicely to your wool mark collection, yeah. which was very dramatic, mm -hmm. very original, and um, quite epoch-making in a way. Did you sell anything? Yes, it really? sold very well. Really? I was six looks. We normally do, in a show, we do 24. Mm -hmm. And for those six looks, we did the, we sold the same amount as 50% of the normal collection. Gosh, so it was good. extremely successful, very exciting. We picked up a lot of new suppliers. Um, it's the most press we've ever had on anything. The, so we can't get this. I'd be wearing it today, but the samples are constantly out of the press room. So yeah, it's been very, very exciting. It's great. So you would recommend anyone who goes in for the Woolmark competition to do something which is really in their heart and their soul. Yes. To do it, even though people say, oh, who's going to wear that? Or that's too commercial, it's too expensive. It's a bit like 
one's final degree show. Mm. This is your time to really show what you are made of. That was the way I approached it, yes. because I didn't go into well, it with was, any expectations. That's why he won. You know, obviously, here was an original, courageous viewpoint. Thank you. I assume mm -hmm. that in a big and successful business, they have learned to balance creativity, the two C's, creativity and commerciality. Mm -hmm. Do you find sometimes that you have to give way on your extreme creativity because they think, well, we're not going to be able to sell it? But you, of course, with your Walmart one, has proved that that is not the case. But the bigger the company, and the more people there are to make the decision, the more timorous they become. Is that true, do you think? No. No? All no. right, tell me what you think. Well, I think a good example of that is Gucci. I right. mean... That the way that they went about that rebrand, that whole creating a new image was extremely risky, but has been extremely, it's, it's worked incredibly yeah. well. And I think in terms of my own business, I have to consider commerciality because I have to sell things. Exactly. But exactly. there are so many ways to approach something that is commercial. It can, I personally find that to have limitations on what I'm doing makes me think more creatively. Always, yes. I think if you, have, if you can do whatever you want, then it just becomes some fatuous, flappy, yes. weird thing. Yes. There's no point. Like, it becomes a fruit salad. Yes. You know, all mixed up together. You know. Not that I'm against fruit salad, let me say. Um, so, in one sentence, all those young guys who'll be watching you. Mm -hmm. What is one mistake that you have made that you wish you hadn't at any point in your career? Oh, goodness. I think... I honestly can't. Does this mean you're so perfect, Edward, that you've <laughs> no. never made a mistake? No, I make, I make mistakes constantly. Well, I was going to say, you see, if anyone asked me that, I would say, <laughs> make as many mistakes as you can, because that's how you learn. I mean, well, that's, that was going to be exactly my point, that I, I always make mistakes, but mistakes feed into what you're doing. Yeah. So they're as almost, almost as valuable as successes. Yes, because the old saying, he who dares eventually wins, mm -hmm. is true if you sit timidly in the corner, you don't get anywhere. Edward, that was absolutely lovely, and I think that the, uh, the viewers will find this very interesting. Oh, I hope so. Um, oh, I have no doubt about it. Thank you very, very much. Oh, thank you.